Uh, I come from INRIA, which is a national French institute on uh, informatics and uh, applied mathematics. And uh, we are now building uh, an institute uh, close to Nice called the NeuroMod Institute about modeling and neuroscience. And it's an exciting time for us uh, neuroscience modelers in this area. And we're supported by a new university called Université Côte d'Azur, which is a kind of superstructure above uh, Nice University, which is uh, quite dynamic. So um, today, uh, I don't need, I think I need to recall the principle of brain-computer interfaces since uh, widely uh, explained by the previous um, speaker. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, more, well, the issue of personalizing uh, BCIs to, to uh, users. Just briefly, uh, the, one of the problems we have are to determine features of brain activity which are going to be able to characterize a mental state. Uh, and you know how noisy these uh, types of recording, whether they're inside or outside the brain um, can be. So how challenging it is to be able to characterize a mental state using uh, such uh, recordings. Uh, this, uh, of course, has to be done in almost real time. Uh, in order to translate uh, these uh, mental states into commands which are meaningful for the subjects. Or in some cases, we can talk about passive BCI, passive uh, brain computer interfaces, in which the subject is not really aware of how uh, their mental states are going to be interpreted, but they can be used to modulate uh, user system interaction. So, brain computer interfaces have been bearing great promises, but for the moment, we can't claim that they're helping many end users. Uh, yes? Sorry? I think so, yeah. I think it's on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's on. It's not uh, loud enough? Yeah. OK. So um, we don't see that many uh, people using BCI in their daily life. And for, from my point of view, the hindrances to this uh, BCI adoption would be, for, well, they have to be really relevant to the people's needs. Uh, as long as people have like one muscle left in their body that they can willfully use, uh, what would be the point maybe of adorning such a complex system and having to learn to use it, etc., if they can do what they want with the remaining muscle and the help of therapists? Uh, there's the issue of availability and of wearability on a really daily, daily basis. And we'll see that gel-based EEG is certainly not a good uh, way uh, to, to acquire EEGs for uh, durability and uh, long-term use. And also, maybe it's, uh, it might be sound a bit uh, superficial, but there are not that many early adopters or role models that can give the people who may need it the incentive to go and, and try to get one and to try to get uh, equipped, etc. Sometimes you need role models like famous, famous people or people that people want to identify with. And well, for this, of course, a lot of work has to be done. So in this talk, I'll talk about how to kind of tailor the BCI to better fit the user's needs, specificities, considering their physiological, psychological specificities, and also, also keeping in mind utility, usability. So the main thing in brain-computer interfaces is that, that there's brain activity. And this brain activity is being acquired by sensors that are, can be placed in different uh, uh, locations. In my talk, it will be mostly non-invasive. Well, only non-invasive. So. EEG-based uh, um, sensors. So uh, between the sensors and the brain, you know that you have all kinds of tissues, all several kinds of tissues that each have specific conductivities. There are cortical foldings that are quite distinct from one person to the next, except for the main, main uh, sulci and gyri. But the details of the foldings are different, which makes the, the, the activity that you see on the person's uh, scalp actually quite different uh, from one person to another. A way of trying to, um, to find, um, let's say, more invariant features in order to be able 
to develop BCIs that will more easily translate from one subject to the next, if that's a, if that's a concern, well, it would be to go to the source space. Uh, because um, and then you get, uh, you get rid of the problem posed by, well, the foldings. Um, and um, also the, the head shape that is uh, different and the electrode position. So, so to do this, to go to source space, you have to, to know where the sensor positions are on the, in 3D on the scalp. Ideally, you need to know the geometry, uh, as I show here in a very detailed way, uh, the geometry of the different tissues, uh, have a hunch of their conductivities, solve the forward and inverse problems, and then get into um, reconstruct the sources uh, as they, um, let's say, as they, as they develop on the, on the cortex. Uh, so dynamic, of course, uh, the dynamic sources, but the forward and inverse problem are not dynamic, they're just static because uh, you can use the quasi-static uh, Maxwell equations. So it's not that hard, and there are many toolboxes that, uh, that allow to, to do this. If, um, if you can't do the source analysis, then you could try to use features that uh, are designed to achieve some kind of invariance. For example, if you have been uh, uh, looking in, in, let's say, in the field of BCI, there's a type of features that is, that is uh, coming into play, which is based on uh, covariance matrices, so it's spatial covariance matrices, sensor uh, across sensor, uh, and the invariance that is achieved with these covariance matrices is that if you consider distances between these matrices when you're looking to cluster them or to classify them, if you look at distances in a specific geometry that is well adapted to uh, covariance matrices, which is the Riemannian geometry of symmetric uh, positive definite uh, matrices. Well, in this geometry, um, you're invariant to linear transformations. So when you consider that the forward problem is a linear transformation of your sources, then there will be a kind of invariance, um, less, meaning that the distance of the covariance matrices um, of two tasks will be very close to the distance of the, of the, of the sources in the source space, let's say, if, if, if you have several uh, sources. Um, so I didn't cite the work, but um, Marco Congedo, uh, Alexandre Baranchon were uh, researchers in Grenoble who were quite uh, instrumental in getting this uh, geometry into BCI. Um, I was saying that there are, uh, there are toolboxes that do allow you to reconstruct source space. So um, this uh, is a widely, uh, widely known uh, now, uh, problem and solution in our community. Um, and the advantage of being in source space is that you're closer to the neurophysiological reality of what is actually going on in the brain that is better interpretable neuroscientifically than if you're just saying that there is a um, there's activity on sensors because you can uh, get different, you can get the dynamics of uh, how uh, activity propagates on the, on the cortex much better than on the, on the sensors. And uh, as I was mentioning, it's going to reduce the variability across the different headsets, across subjects, across sessions. So, uh, okay, uh, in, in other fields now people are moving to source space more and more in uh, neuropsychology uh, especially. And I uh, will give you one uh, illustrative example of using source space in uh, brain computer interfaces. This was in a um, uh, national project called CoADAPT, which I was coordinating uh, uh, a few years ago. And um, we were trying to use, uh, on top of BCI, which is the, the, black, uh, the black loop here, we were introducing a new red meta uh, information, which is to try to detect from the brain of the subject uh, performing a BCI to detect some indication that there's an error going on. Uh, for example, that the feedback which was given to the subject is not correct, or that the command uh, that is done is not correct. Then an error will, um, will be detected by the subject, which uh, relates to an error-related potential in the EEG. 
So detecting this error-related potential allows to relabel uh, um, trials as ha being faulty, been, have been having been badly classified, and thus to improve uh, the classifier. And detecting errors in uh, uh, EEG uh, signals is not that trivial because generally you need quite a lot of examples to be able to uh, to correctly uh, identify a feature and if uh, the BCI is making too many errors and people are not going to uh, be motivated to use it and so there is a and there's a kind of conundrum here how to to be able to uh, identify these errors quite quickly and an answer was to go into source space using a FURIA algorithm developed by Fabien Lott um, uh, and co-workers and Okay, by going into source space and looking for features specifically in the Broadman areas known to generate uh, such error potentials, it was much uh, more efficient to be able to uh, uh, detect errors and then um, leading to, um, to online correction. So, um, okay, even though we go into source space, um, we have to keep in mind that the brain activity may still be uh, variable across subjects. Uh, well, here's actually just on three electrodes, not even in source space, but I'm showing motor imagery, uh, brain-computer interfaces, so uh, what uh, is often called ERD, ERS, and ERD, ERS, S means synchronization uh, above the baseline uh, synchronization, and ERD means desynchronization of, um, um, of oscillatory uh, rhythms of the brain. So here we have time frequency maps um, in which uh, people are instructed to move their right hand between zero and two seconds. And you can see that, well, there's a time reaction. So the desynchronization that you see on the left uh, hemisphere uh, occurs a little bit after zero seconds and, and stops a little bit after uh, two, uh, two seconds. Then you see uh, ERS, which is a synchronization, and red, which is power that is stronger than the baseline that was occurring before the, the movement. So this is a typical uh, time frequency map, averaged over many, many repetitions, like 100 uh, repetitions, for it to be so clear. You wouldn't get such a clear map in a single trial. But what you can see when comparing different subjects that you don't have the same powers at all across uh, subjects. In some, um, in some cases, the, what is called the beta band is uh, more prominent than, uh, than others. So if you're using the same uh, classifiers uh, across subjects, you might run into a lot of trouble. Source space will uh, kind of alleviate some of these problems. It's you're not going to reconstruct a lot of power and frequencies that weren't there in the first place, in the first place on your sensors, right? Um, so um, the the way to try to uh, get beyond this uh, intersubject variability, well, generally, is just to ask the subject to calibrate the, the BCI for a long time before it starts. Um, so this allows to learn, indeed, features and classifiers, but the, the state of the art and the current BCI research is really trying to get rid of this calibration phase to have more plug-and-play BCIs where you don't have to train, train before using. Um, and so the idea is to use transfer learning um, which does domain adaptation of the, of the features. And then once the subject is already using the BCI with the feedback, with the commands uh, coming into play, then you get features that are even more uh, informative of how the, that will be even more, let's say, uh, efficient. And you can fine tune your classifier and get better, uh, better classifier. Why do I say it's more efficient when this person is using the BCI rather than when they're calibrating the BCI? Is because when they're using the BCI, they're, they're in another frame of mind. They're using the BCI. So they're getting other types of information. They're <coughs> engaged in another task than just calibration. So even between calibration and use, there's already here uh, a mismatch of the features. And it's important to, uh, to retrain, to fine-tune uh, the classifier while the person is using it. So there's quite a lot of 
of references on uh, transfer learning. It's, a, it's quite an important topic these days, and uh, I hope that, that it will come into the onto uh, the, the BCIs that people will use um, uh, will be using uh, very soon. Um, here I only give you one example of right hand uh, movement imagination. Why, why, should, any, why should everybody uh, be able to do right hand movement imagination? I'm currently working with a uh, um, disabled person uh, in view of training her for a competition called a Cybathlon and she has never, uh, never moved her left hand uh, uh, in a useful way. So for her left hand movement and imagination, for example, would be, uh, would be not possible. I mean, talking to, to people who are disabled and asking them to imagine movements that they have maybe never been able to do in their life is kind of far-fetched. Um, so you really have to tailor mental imagery. Let's call it mental imagery, not motor imagery, because uh, maybe imagining music, imagining language, imagining uh, um, some, uh, some landscapes, imagining other things might be much more relevant for some users. So you have to think of your user and get to your user's frame of mind to understand what mental imagery they may be uh, more interested and more <coughs> proficient in, um, in using. Then you would have to also uh, look at psychological traits of people. Some people are really uh, super able to uh, think in 3D or to uh, solve certain types of problems and others have more other types of interests. And according to these traits, then the, the, training, the BCI training progression can be uh, really adapt. There's very interesting work on that by uh, uh, Andre Kubler's uh, group or Fabien Lotz's group also. Um, then, of course, since the BCI is supposed to be used, well, what are the commands the user wants to do? Um, does he want just to press some button? Does he want to, to move uh, uh, continuously uh, uh, um, uh, a cursor or a robotic arm? Um, is it better for the person to be, to be using a BCI that is self-paced or system-paced? If it's self-paced, the, the person can decide at any moment of, a, of an action to, uh, to, to give, but there might be a limited number of actions. Uh, if it's system-paced, well, then you have some stimuli that are uh, displayed or conveyed to the subject. It can be tactile, auditory, uh, visual. So all this has to be uh, thought of um, quite uh, deeply. Um, and to learn about the user, uh, we, we developed a, uh, an empirical approach uh, which tries to learn uh, about the user by asking the user questions but in a BCI point of view. Um, so the idea is from the BCI, from the computer point of view, the computer is going to try to learn about the subject by acting by doing a certain number of uh, um, actions according to observations. Uh, what are these actions? What are these observations going to be become clearer in the, in the next slide? But basically, we're going to use an exploration-exploitation trade-off. And so you immediately think of reinforcement learning uh, uh, approach, in which exploring means learning about the user from the computer point of view. Exploiting means act uh, optimally according to the current knowledge. So what can be the goal of a, of a computer in the brain-computer interface? It can be to, in the case where we want to learn about the user, is to determine automatically the best classified mental task and to save calibration time and to do that as fast as possible. So let's imagine you have a bunch of tasks, k tasks, that uh, we might uh, propose to the user to, to, to do, for example, moving their, imagining moving their left hand, their feet, their right hand, well, we would tailor that to whatever the subject is able to imagine, their tongue, their arm, etc. 
And we're going to try to find, as fast as possible, the task that is best uh, classified with respect to the idle state. Because you mustn't forget, there's also an idle state, because people don't always want to be doing tasks. They sometimes just want to do nothing. And the BCI has to recognize that, too. So the no control idle state. So we're going to use uh, a computational model called uh, it's a kind of barbaric name, but a stochastic multi-armed bandit. So what is a bandit? It's in Las Vegas, these machines where you try to, to get um, money. Uh, multi-armed because we have several of these machines. And uh, stochastic because um, these machines have a, a reward that we don't know and that we're go we are going to put a model for the, for the re reward and we're going to try to, we imagine that one of these machines is kind of more rewarding than the others and we're going to try to find which one it is by going, going in turn to, to try them out. So in the case of, um, an, in the case of an usual multi-armed bandit, the goal is to maximize the sum of the rewards, all the money you're getting. And in the case of BCI, what we're trying to maximize is the classification rate of one of the bandits, which is one of the tasks. We're going to try to find a task that maximizes the classification rate. So for this, um, I said it was stochastic because we don't know the classification rate that we want to maximize by definition, we're trying to learn about it. So, but we can assume that we know it just in the confidence interval. We're going to do each task, let's say, twice. And then we get a estimated classification rate, which is in blue here. Okay, so here we have two tasks, sorry, just two tasks. Oops. Uh, and um, we estimate a classification rate of, of these two tasks um, compared to the resting state. Uh, the, the true classification rate is what we're trying to discover as fast as possible. It's in red here. And we have this upper confidence bound. According to the number of times we've sampled uh, the tasks, we can know with a certain confidence that the uh, true classification rate is within a certain uh, bound. This green uh, star we actually can compute. And what uh, the... Uh, um, uh, upper confidence bounds theory uh, in um, reinforcement learning gives you is it allows you to determine at each step which is the task you should select in order to converge as quickly as possible to the best one. And it's quite easy. The best task to select is the one that maximizes the upper confidence bounds, which we can compute at each step. So um, I'll, I'll skip all the details, but for example, uh, this uh, inequality guarantees that the, that the number of times you have chosen a task M decreases uh, in square of the distance to the optimal uh, classification rate, which is R. So if you're far away from the optimal classification rate, you shouldn't uh, be presenting this task too often, which is what happens we did it uh, online to, uh, to test between three tasks, foot, sorry, small, uh, feet, right hand, and tongue here. We were asking people randomly at first, um, well, no. Generally, when you do a, a calibration, you ask the person to do as many times feet, tongue, uh, and right hand. And here, we're running our, our algorithm so that, well, first it does each of the tasks uh, once, and then it selects automatically using this uh, upper uh, confidence bound algorithm, which is the next task that the person should be asked to do. And uh, at the end, we see that the feet had been asked 28 times, the right hand 19 times, and the tongue 13 times. Uh, this is the, the last line on this, uh, on this um, table, uh, showing that for a given budget, which was uh, 60, I think there were 60 task presentations in total. We hadn't wasted time on showing the person the tongue to perform because quite fast the algorithm sees that the 
uh, classification rate of the tongue is quite low, and so it it's kind of spends more time on exploring the best task, which we are here, uh, feet and right hand, but to, to end up, after a few checks, really finding out that the feet was the best, uh, the best uh, classification rate. So this, this can be a faster way to, um, to learn about what task uh, the BCI will be able to classify best. Once you have asked the subject what are the tasks he thinks that he will be able to perform. Now, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, it's ten I have 10 minutes left? It's five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. Um, so I mentioned already that we have to adapt the BCI stimuli and feedback. Um, for people who are really disabled, uh, of course, consider um, independent BCI, which will not rely on any muscle activity. For example, when you think of the P300 <laughs> speller uh, or the SSVEP, it relies on looking at a screen and uh, looking at targets on a screen, and this relies on eye movements, for example. And some, some um, locked-in uh, syndrome people have difficulty with eye movements, so you have to think of maybe auditory BCI for these people, or another type of uh, a visual display or tactile display. Um, now, I'm going to focus here maybe on make BCI practical to wear and use. And this uh, comes out of a project that we had with Nice University Hospital, who came to us about six, seven years ago, saying, okay, I'm an ergotherapist, uh, okay, patient therapist at Nice University, uh, working with ALS uh, patients, and we have some patients for whom we can't find a muscle that we are able to, uh, on which we're able to attach a contactor that we usually do to allow them to uh, perform their daily uh, activities. So this, this came really from the hospital. Could we work with you on BCI? So we thought it was a great opportunity to, to bring a BCI out of the lab. So this is why I'm, I'm concerned about this because we have this experience with, uh, with Nice. And so we thought that the simplest uh, BCI was a P300 speller because it was already working pretty well on, uh, in the literature and there were even some commercial uh, systems available. But when we tested the commercial systems, they didn't work at all. So we decided to run our own, develop our own. So we did, um, we did a BCI system, which I can show you working here quite fast. Here we have a patient, you see she does have motor uh, ability, but she's unable to speak. She's in the bulbar uh, onset of an ALS. Uh, maybe in five years she won't be able to move her muscles either, unfortunately. So learning uh, to use a BCI while you still have some uh, uh, residual ability is, uh, is perhaps important for if you get to a stage where you can't uh, so here she's looking, she's gazing at letters that are flashing with smileys. As mentioned, the smileys uh, give a kind of better ERP than um, just the letters. And after a few flashes of each letter, you see the face. She's able to select uh, the letter she wants to, to, to write. She's writing the word rêver, which means to dream. And uh, of course, she would be able to select actions and not uh, letters exactly in the same way. It's a selection. Uh, principle, and it's working quite well, but you see she has uh, an, an EG headset, uh, just a, a usual EG headset on her head, and it's not that practical, and the people at Nice University also said, no way can we have EG like that in people's homes, it's not, not practical for somebody to put on their head when they have already so many problems, and putting gel at the same place each day, you imagine the scalp after a few weeks, uh, uh, lots of issues, um, so it's not it's not practical for the moment. Although people are satisfied with it, well, maybe they wanted to please us when they when they answer the questionnaire because they actually asked to take it home. They wanted to practice with it at home, but we we believe it's not yet uh, totally practical. Although it works well in time in terms of accuracy, it detects very well the, what the person wants to to uh, select. Um, the patients, sometimes they have a network, uh, and so other ALS patients in France learned that, uh, that some ALS patients in Nice were testing our system, and this person in the Alps uh, said, okay, I want to test your system, but we couldn't go and see him, so we, we said, we'll, we can, you can download our software. So he downloaded um, the application for doing a BCI, 
and he on his own computer, etc. So we didn't provide anything uh, in terms of hardware, just the software. And then he ordered an emotive epoch uh, over the internet. And he had a person, he's severely, severely um, uh, disabled. He can only move his eyes. And he, asked, he had somebody come every week to help him uh, try to set the epoch on and, and to try to connect it to the system, etc. And after a while, he was uh, happy to be able to use it. And he wrote a blog about it. And he got a prize from the Academy of Science. And he, so I mean, people like this are very encouraging. People who, who go out of their <laughs> uh, medical routine to try to help uh, the research into BCI actually get used. This is encouraging for the field because we think, OK, uh, we've, got to do, we've got to finish you know, our, our work also and try to go further. So as I was saying, gel-based electrodes are, are a problem. Uh, we have uh, some great colleagues like Professor Hauweisen and uh, TU Ilmenau now in Germany who, who really are trying to push forward the state of dry electrodes which are with the concern that there's a comfort um, compromise between comfort and signal quality. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, worn dry electrodes. Some of these with the uh, gold pins were just, uh, you have to be a fakir, right, to, uh, <laughs> to enjoy that. Um, and now they have more um, um, compliant um, plastic type coated with uh, AG, AGCL electrodes which are nicer to you don't feel them as much but the thing is that you have you do have to apply pressure you do have a, to apply some pressure for them to work and with these with these um, text textile uh, caps it's just impossible for you and you and you to be able to have the right pressure on each uh, on each electrode so at the moment with Nice University Hospital uh, and Université Côte d'Azur we're designing custom design headsets, which means we 3D scan somebody's head. After all, if they break their arm, they're going to have a cast, right? And nobody thinks that it's so expensive to uh, build a cast for their arm. Well, here, what we do is we 3D scan their head, and then we build a, a cast of their head on which we design with some silicone, um, uh, just a, the, a place where just the right number and the right position of electrodes have to be applied. This has to be fabricated. There's some oven uh, stuff. Uh, and then the electrodes that I showed you before that are nice plastic, not too, uh, not too um, hurtful, they're just slid, slided into the right uh, positions that are already you know, planned. And uh, you can wear that for quite a long time. We're testing that the impedances stay uh, constant for a long time, and you don't really feel it. It's still a bit heavy, uh, but you don't really uh, feel it. It could, be, um, it could be printed with whatever the patient would like to wear. It could be uh, kind of fun. So we could have some role models one day uh, wearing those, those things. And well, what's really important is that they it takes one second to, to put on. Just literally one second, and you don't have to spend 15 minutes putting gel and worrying about all that. The performance for P300 are almost on par with the gel, not quite. You don't have quite as good signal quality. So conclusions, uh, my guidelines towards personalized BCI are, well, learning from, with, and about the users, spending time with the people who are going to spend time using your system, starting with simple BCI, like we did with the P300, and then maybe going further uh, uh, later on, like we're doing for the Cybathlon at the moment. Uh, outsourcing, really having living labs, places where people are going to try, and even at home, uh, value-centered design, of course. Uh, but hardware and software, I didn't mention it, but we, we try our software to be really uh, you know, multi-platform, uh, to be accessible, uh, open uh, as much as possible. It's downloadable to whoever uh, would like to use it. And uh, we need actually wearable sensors. Uh, the software, uh, as I was saying, interoperable. OK, one important thing, too, you want to be able to uh, use existing applications, not develop your own office for BCI, but allow 
uh, open office to be able to take BCI commands. So that's an important thing for neuroinformatics is you have to hack into, uh, have a try and horse into existing applications because you're not going to spend time developing all those uh, uh, software that are already uh, quite efficient, but find the handle, find the handle for BCI users. And well, fundamental brain research was mentioned also in the talk before. Of course, we need to learn a lot more about all those networks and nervous system uh, components that uh, people are using in the BCI and uh, about plasticity of the brain. Uh, before I stop, I would like to thank all the contributors uh, to this presentation, including the patients and Damien Perrier, the patient from uh, Chambéry. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that we're using OpenVibe so software, which is developed in INRIA to do BCI, it's open source, and uh, acknowledge the support from sponsors. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Time for one, two short questions. We will have the discussion later on. Yes, on the back, no, sorry, sorry, Kasha, later. Huh? The second one. No, the, the, there is a question over there. You are the first on the end of the call. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question about BCI for communication. Um, I was wondering whether you have an experience working with people who have um, cognitive impairment for like uh, when you have advanced neurodegeneration, um, people who can't maybe communicate what, uh, what they want to do or how they feel and whether you or maybe who can't take instruction about what to do in a mm. specific task or how to indicate what they want? Uh, no, I, I, I'm sorry, but uh, for the moment, no. Um, actually, in the P300 uh, speller screening we did before inclusion, we had uh, avoided the cognitive uh, deficits, but it is uh, true that it is uh, also um, maybe a reproach we could make because uh, a lot of ALS patients do develop cognitive deficits. So we have to, to be aware of that. Um, and I mean, um, maybe the, I can refer you to the work of Michael Tangerman in the University of Freiburg, who's uh, working on that uh, very closely on uh, cognitive impairment and how BCI can be used to, uh, to, uh, to work on that, but I can't. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Second question, Kasia Blinoska, in the middle. No, no, wait for a microphone. Wait for your microphone. Huh? Okay. I'm interested how much uh, transformation to source space improved the performance of BCI. Hmm. Because, you know, with inverse solution, there are certain problems. Do you have some comparison how it worked with transformation to source space or just the raw signals? Mm -hmm. Was it really improved? Yes, uh, I think that error potential um, study is the one that, uh, that shows the most how, how it has improved and the number of examples that you need to, um, to get a correct classification uh, So in that, in that study. If not, we had tried with motor imagery uh, quite a long time ago, we had shown a small improvement with my colleague, with my PhD student, uh, Joanne Fruité. We had shown a small improvement of uh, classification rate and motor mm -hmm. imagery, but it wasn't super significant. Uh, but I think all the same, um, that if you know uh, if you know the regions in which you are looking for activity, for example, a neurofeedback. Uh, imagine that you're um, using BCI to try to um, to enhance the motor activity in a certain region for a person who had a stroke, for example. I think it is, I mean, in fMRI, they do it in fMRI, right? They go to the voxels in uh, fMRI space and they look at the voxels where the activity is supposed to lie, not elsewhere. And so if we can do it in the uh, EGMEG, I mean, why? Why not do it if we have the, of course, we have the head shape, etc. But for patients who really uh, need uh, personalized care on their brain activity and neurofeedback, I think there is really worth it. Worth it. No, because my impression is that the simple few transforms <laughs> is enough, <laughs> maybe. Yes, in this but, case. but uh, let's say if you're inter interested in the detail, in the anatomical details, then it's interesting. Can we move the more detailed discussion on the topic? Okay.